The golden rule philosophy is based upon a law which no man can circumvent. This law is the same law that is described in Lesson 11 on accurate thought, through the operation of which one's thoughts are transformed into reality corresponding exactly to the nature of the thoughts. Once grant the creative power of our thought, and there is an end of struggling for our own way, and an end of gaining it at someone else's expense. For, since by the terms of the hypothesis we can create what we like, the simplest way of getting what we want is not to snatch it from somebody else, but to make it for ourselves. And since there is no limit to thought, there can be no need for straining, and for everyone to have his own way in this manner would be to banish all strife, want, sickness, and sorrow from the earth. Now it is precisely on this assumption of the creative power of our thought that the whole Bible rests. If not, what is the meaning of being saved by faith? Faith is essentially thought, and therefore every call to have faith in God is a call to trust in the power of our own thought about God. According to your faith, be it unto you, says the Old Testament. The entire book is nothing but one continuous statement of the creative power of thought. The law of man's individuality is therefore the law of liberty, and equally it is the gospel of peace. For when we truly understand the law of our own individuality, we see that the same law finds its expression in everyone else, and consequently we shall reverence the law in others exactly in proportion as we value it in ourselves. To do this is to follow the golden rule of doing to others what we would they should do unto us. And because we know that the law of liberty in ourselves must include the free use of our creative power, there is no longer any inducement to infringe the rights of others, for we can satisfy all our desires by the exercise of our knowledge of the law. As this comes to be understood, cooperation will take the place of competition, with the result of removing all ground for enmity, whether between individuals, classes, or nations. The foregoing quotation is from Bible Mystery and Bible Meaning by the late Judge T. Troward, published by Robert McBride and Company, New York City. Judge Troward was the author of several interesting volumes, among them the Edinburgh Lectures, which is recommended to all students of this course. If you wish to know what happens to a man when he totally disregards the law upon which the Golden Rule philosophy is based, Pick out any man in your community whom you know to live for the single dominating purpose of accumulating wealth, and who has no conscientious scruples as to how he accumulates that wealth. Study this man, and you will observe that there is no warmth to his soul, there is no kindness to his words, there is no welcome to his face. He has become a slave to the desire for wealth. He is too busy to enjoy life and too selfish to wish to help others enjoy it. He walks and talks and breathes, but he is nothing but a human automaton. Yet there are many who envy such a man and wish that they might occupy his position, foolishly believing him to be a success. There can never be success without happiness, and no man can be happy without dispensing happiness to others. Moreover, the dispensation must be voluntary and with no other object in view than that of spreading sunshine into the hearts of those whose hearts are heavy laden with burdens. George D. Heron had in mind the law upon which the Golden Rule philosophy is based when he said, We have talked much of the brotherhood to come, but brotherhood has always been the fact of our life, long before it became a modern and inspired sentiment. Only we have been brothers in slavery and torment, brothers in ignorance and its perdition, brothers in disease and war and want, brothers in prostitution and hypocrisy. What happens to one of us sooner or later happens to all. We have always been inescapably involved in common destiny. The world constantly tends to the level of the downmost man in it, and that downmost man is the world's real ruler, hugging it close to his bosom, dragging it down to his death. You do not think so, but it is true, and it ought to be true. For if there was some way by which some of us could get free, apart from others, if there were some way by which some of us could have heaven while others had hell, if there were some way by which part of the world could escape some form of the blight and peril and misery of disinherited labor, then indeed would our world be lost and damned. But since men have never been able to separate themselves from one another's woes and wrongs, since history is fairly stricken with the lesson that we cannot escape brotherhood of some kind, since the whole of life is teaching us that we are hourly choosing between brotherhood in suffering and brotherhood in good, it remains for us to choose the brotherhood of a cooperative world, 
with all its fruits thereof, the fruits of love and liberty. The World War ushered us into an age of cooperative effort in which the law of live and let live stands out like a shining star to guide us in our relationships with each other. This great universal call for cooperative effort is taking on many forms, not the least important of which are the Rotary Clubs, the Kiwanis Clubs, the Lions Clubs, and the many other luncheon clubs which bring men together in a spirit of friendly intercourse. For these clubs mark the beginning of an age of friendly competition in business. The next step will be a closer alliance of all such clubs in an out-and-out -out spirit of friendly cooperation. The attempt by Woodrow Wilson and his contemporaries to establish the League of Nations, followed by the efforts of Warren G. Harding to give footing to the same cause under the name of the World Court, marked the first attempt in the history of the world to make the Golden Rule effective as a common meeting ground for the nations of the world. There is no escape from the fact that the world has awakened to the truth in George D. Heron's statement that we are hourly choosing between brotherhood in suffering and brotherhood in good. The world war has taught us, nay, forced upon us, the truth that a part of the world cannot suffer without injury to the whole world. These facts are called to your attention not in the nature of a preachment on morality, but for the purpose of directing your attention to the underlying law through which these changes are being brought about. For more than four thousand years the world has been thinking about the Golden Rule philosophy, and that thought is now becoming transformed into realization of the benefits that accrue to those who apply it. Still mindful of the fact that the student of this course is interested in a material success that can be measured by bank balances, it seems appropriate to suggest here that all who will may profit by shaping their business philosophy to conform with this sweeping change toward cooperation which is taking place all over the world. If you can grasp the significance of the tremendous change that has come over the world since the close of the World War, and if you can interpret the meaning of all the luncheon clubs and other similar gatherings which bring men and women together in a spirit of friendly cooperation, surely your imagination will suggest to you the fact that this is an opportune time to profit by adopting this spirit of friendly cooperation as the basis of your own business or professional philosophy. Stated conversely, it must be obvious to all who make any pretense of thinking accurately that the time is at hand when failure to adopt the golden rule as the foundation of one's business or professional philosophy is the equivalent of economic suicide. Perhaps you have wondered why the subject of honesty has not been mentioned in this course as a prerequisite to success, and if so, the answer will be found in this lesson. The golden rule philosophy, when rightly understood and applied, makes dishonesty impossible. It does more than this. It makes impossible all the other destructive qualities, such as selfishness, greed, envy, bigotry, hatred, and malice. When you apply the golden rule, you become, at one and the same time, both the judge and the judged, the accused and the accuser. This places one in a position in which honesty begins in one's own heart, toward oneself, and extends to all others with equal effect. Honesty based upon the golden rule, is not the brand of honesty which recognizes nothing but the question of expediency. It is no credit to be honest when honesty is obviously the most profitable policy, lest one lose a good customer or a valuable client, or be sent to jail for trickery. But when honesty means either a temporary or a permanent material loss, then it becomes an honor of the highest degree to all who practice it. Such honesty has its appropriate reward in the accumulated power of character and reputation enjoyed by all who deserve it. Those who understand and apply the Golden Rule philosophy are always scrupulously honest, not alone out of their desire to be just with others, but because of their desire to be just with themselves. They understand the eternal law upon which the Golden Rule is based, and they know that through the operation of this law every thought they release and every act in which they indulge has its counterpart in some fact or circumstance with which they will later be confronted. Golden Rule philosophers are honest because they understand the truth that honesty adds to their own character, that vital something which gives it life and power. Those who understand the law through which the Golden Rule operates would poison their own drinking water as quickly as they would indulge in acts of injustice to others, for they know that such injustice starts a chain of causation that will not only bring them physical suffering, but will destroy their characters, 
stain for ill their reputations and render impossible the attainment of enduring success. The law through which the Golden Rule philosophy operates is none other than the law through which the principle of autosuggestion operates. This statement gives you a suggestion from which you should be able to make a deduction of a far-reaching nature and of inestimable value. Test your progress in the mastery of this course by analyzing the foregoing statement and determining, before you read on, what suggestion it offers you. Of what possible benefit could it be to you to know that when you do unto others as if you were the others, which is the sum and substance of the golden rule, you are putting into motion a chain of causation through the aid of a law which affects the others according to the nature of your act, and at the same time planting in your character through your subconscious mind the effects of that act? This question practically suggests its own answer, but as I am determined to cause you to think this vital subject out for yourself, I will put the question in still another form, viz. If all your acts toward others, and even your thoughts of others, are registered in your subconscious mind, through the principle of autosuggestion, thereby building your own character an exact duplicate of your thoughts and acts, can you not see how important it is to guard those acts and thoughts? We are now in the very heart of the real reason for doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. For it is obvious that whatever we do unto others, we do unto ourselves. Stated in another way, every act and every thought you release modifies your own character in exact conformity with the nature of the act or thought, and your character is a sort of center of magnetic attraction which attracts to you the people and conditions that harmonize with it. You cannot indulge in an act toward another person without having first created the nature of that act in your own thought, and you cannot release a thought without planting the sum and substance and nature of it in your own subconscious mind, there to become a part and parcel of your own character. Grasp this simple principle and you will understand why you cannot afford to hate or envy another person. You will also understand why you cannot afford to strike back in kind at those who do you an injustice. Likewise, you will understand the injunction, Return good for evil. Understand the law upon which the golden rule injunction is based, and you will understand also the law that eternally binds all mankind in a single bond of fellowship, and renders it impossible for you to injure another person by thought or deed without injuring yourself and likewise adds to your own character the results of every kind thought and deed in which you indulge. Understand this law, and you will then know, beyond room for the slightest doubt, that you are constantly punishing yourself for every wrong you commit and rewarding yourself for every act of constructive conduct in which you indulge. It seems almost an act of providence that the greatest wrong and the most severe injustice ever done me by one of my fellow men was done just as I began this lesson. Some of the students of this course will know what it is to which I refer. This injustice has worked a temporary hardship on me, but that is of little consequence compared to the advantage it has given me by providing a timely opportunity for me to test the soundness of the entire premise upon which this lesson is founded. The injustice to which I refer left two courses of action open to me. I could have claimed relief by striking back at my antagonist, through both civil court action and criminal libel proceedings, or I could have stood upon my right to forgive him. One course of action would have brought me a substantial sum, of money and whatever joy and satisfaction there may be in defeating and punishing an enemy. The other course of action would have brought me self-respect, which is enjoyed by those who have successfully met the test and discovered that they have evolved to the point at which they can repeat the Lord's Prayer and mean it. I chose the latter course. I did so despite the recommendations of close personal friends to strike back and despite the offer of a prominent lawyer to do my striking for me without cost. But the lawyer offered to do the impossible, for the reason that no man can strike back at another without cost. Not always is the cost of a monetary nature, for there are other things with which one may pay that are dearer than money. It would be as hopeless to try to make one who is not familiar with the law upon which the golden rule is based understand why I refused to strike back at this enemy, as it would to try to describe the law of gravitation to an ape. If you understand this law, you understand also why I chose to forgive my enemy. 
In the Lord's Prayer, we are admonished to forgive our enemies, but that admonition will fall on deaf ears except where the listener understands the law upon which it is based. That law is none other than the law upon which the golden rule is based. It is the law that forms the foundation of this entire lesson, and through which we must inevitably reap that which we sow. There is no escape from the operation of this law, nor is there any cause to try to avoid its consequences if we refrain from putting into motion thoughts and acts that are destructive.